I want to begin this morning with a couple of Bible texts. One is this one. You have seen it. You've read it. You've heard it. Many of you count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. In a similar way, Paul, writing to the Thessalonian church, said, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Now, every one of us have been through some trials and circumstances that did not lead us into this, did not lead us into joy, did not lead us into giving thanks. And if you haven't been through some trials, I have bad news for you. They're coming. Even in the past few weeks for myself, with as we went back home to family in Iowa, South Dakota, and here with our church family as well, there are marriages that are struggling because... Sometimes there's substance abuse, sometimes there's adultery, sometimes there's sexual immorality, or they just grow cold. There are those who suffer because of treatments for cancer after they've had another kind of cancer. I know of others who are struggling because of financial stress, broken relationships, the loss of children, countless ways that everyone here has suffered through trials. And whenever the trials come, the question for every one of us is this, what are you, what are you going to do with it? How will you respond to it? Will you really count it all joy? Will you pray? Will you give thanks? Or will you turn bitter, cynical, angry, and just no fun to be around? I have chosen both of those over and over. Some of you here this morning have suffered through painful experiences and it follows you. You just can't get over it. And you're sometimes ugly because of it. On the other hand, I have observed people who are struggling through horrible pain, loneliness, rejection, hardship. It can be an illness, financial hardship, all kinds of things. And there is this stunning well-being with joy and with gratitude. I've watched people who have had nearly everything precious stripped away from them, including family, struggling through unspeakable hard times, and yet persevere with joy and gratitude. So how do you do that? Well, we find the answer to those questions in the story of Joseph. Joseph's story is recorded in great detail, particularly in the last 13 chapters of Genesis, beginning with chapter 37. It is a story that is full of ups and downs, it seemed that he would take one step forward, two steps backwards. These are some of the trials. We're going to talk about them. And it's helpful as we do that to notice that some of this happens because of his own sin. Some of it happens because of the sin of others. And some of it happens just because we live in a sinful, cursed world. That happens for all of us. Joseph's father, Jacob, loved and favored Joseph more than his other brothers. And this poisoned the whole family system. Some of us live in a poisoned family system. And so Joseph started life as a spoiled brat. Daddy gave him the coat of many colors. And Joseph was arrogant. He's full of himself. His brothers hated him. Especially when he came up with the dreams that would indicate that they, someday, the brothers would bow down to him. So the brothers conspire to kill him, but after some discussion, they compromise and they sell him instead to some Ishmaelite slave traders 
for 20 pieces of silver, and he's taken to Egypt. Chapter 39, things begin to look up for a while. He's purchased by Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, and the captain of the guard. Potiphar likes him, entrusts everything he owns to him, but Potiphar's wife is a strongly attracted to him, keeps making <clears throat> attempts to seduce him, and she gets tired of his rejections, and so she frames him so that he's put in prison. Chapter 40, things go fairly well in prison, if they can go well in prison, right? He's put in charge again, and then the baker and the butler of the pharaoh who had been put in prison with Joseph, are on the hunt to understand their dreams. Joseph gives them the meaning of their dreams. The baker is hanged and the butler is restored. Joseph asks the butler to remember him when he gets back into Pharaoh's court. The butler forgets. Until two years later. Chapter 41, Pharaoh has the dream of the skinny cows eating up the fat cows. No one in the land can interpret the dreams. The light comes on for the butler. Oh, yes, there's this man named Joseph in prison who could do that. And so they bring Joseph out of prison. He gives the interpretation. There's going to be seven years of abundance. Followed by seven years of famine, he gives Pharaoh some counsel on how to manage his kingdom. Because of what's coming, Joseph is given charge over the entire land of Egypt. He has great power and wisdom, stores up grain for the future. And in the years of famine, his brothers are driven to come and buy grain from him. Joseph plays some games with them until he reveals himself to them. Chapter 45, they are astounded, they're speechless. Then they all, including Jacob, the father, <clears throat> come to settle into Egypt. Pharaoh establishes Joseph's family in the land of Goshen, the best land that Egypt had to offer. Chapter 50, finally, now, Jacob dies, and we pick up our reading at verse 15. Let's read it together. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father gave this command before he died. Now, this is almost certainly a lie. Because now here they are trying to protect themselves so that after all that the brothers have been through already with Joseph, they're still lying to him one more time. This is the lie. Say to Joseph, please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. And now be, please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. Now here is Joseph's response. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for I, am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive. So do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. So, all of that to say that Joseph suffered horribly at the hands of his brothers. Sold into slavery, years in prison. If there was anyone who could become bitter, it would be him. Especially toward his brothers and bitter toward God. Bitter about life. But instead, Joseph demonstrates a heart and life transformation that brings healing, change, and fruit for his family and countless others. Six years ago, Maria Konnikova 
wrote a fascinating article in the New Yorker on how we can be resilient, especially in the face of trials. And she referred to George Bonanno, a clinical psychologist at Columbia University's Teachers College, who said that the, a central element to have resilience in the face of trials is your perception. So, in other words, what do you see in the midst of it? See, every, and this is what they said, every event can be traumatic or not. What you see and believe about what's happening matters more than the trial itself. It depends on what you see and believe. And this is what Joseph demonstrates for us so that we as well can experience healing, change, and fruit for ourselves, our family, and countless others. And so now let's think about what do we need to see? Let's look at Joseph's story. And the first thing that we need to see is this. God is God and I am not. Is there an amen in the house for that one? Now, you can say amen all you want, but you forget every day, right? Years ago, I had a seminary professor who told us that there are three rules we must never forget. I've shown this before some time ago, and that is God is God, I am not, and sin confuses the first two. If you go back to our text, the brothers assume that Joseph must certainly still be resentful and holding a grudge. It was the way of the family system. And now since their father died, there would be nothing that would hold him back from following through with making them pay for what they did. But if you look at verse 17, he says... Verse 19, he says, do not fear, don't be afraid, because I am not going to retaliate against you. Clearly, his heart has been healed, and he has forgiven them. And then he demonstrates or shows us what he sees to make this possible. He says, do not fear, for am I in the place of God? And here's why he would say that. This is how he's thinking here. Who can know what people deserve for what they've done? Do you know the motives of a person's heart when they did what they did? Do you know the pressures they were under? Do you know their background, their family history, amen? Do you know those things, right? And then when God is God, you are also thinking in this way, who has the right, the authority, and the power to give people what they deserve? And when you look at those two questions, you know the answer. And yet, we mess this up all the time. God makes it clear through his word that he is the only one who can know and rightly give people what they deserve. And when you read through the last half of Genesis, 26 chapters are devoted to the life of Jacob and his family. It is a mess of sin, conflict, vengeance, retribution within the family, with the neighbors, as well, Genesis makes it clear that polygamy will always lead to a horrible mess of conflict. And there's fighting, there's grudges between wives, between family members. And through all of this conflict, here's what you see, that whenever you take up God's position of knowing and punishing others, you will perpetually devastate yourself and others. Do you know how unqualified you are for taking God's position? Give me your resume, right? How unqualified are we? 
And so Joseph could have most easily perpetuated this deeply poisonous family system mess, but instead he sees differently. He surrenders, submits all of this mess of his life to God. And he says, God knows what people deserve, and he alone has the right to give them what they deserve. So here's what else we need to see. God is always working good for his people. If you look at verse 20, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. You see evil, I see the good, the good that God has been doing. In chapter 41, verses 50, 51, 52, after Joseph, Joseph had been rotting in prison, he got his break by telling Pharaoh the meaning of his dreams. He becomes ruler, ruler of Egypt, and five years later, during the last few years of the abundant period, the seven years of abundance, Joseph has two sons. And in verse 51, he called the name of the firstborn son Manasseh, and he said, the reason he calls him that is because God has made me forget all of my hardship. The second son, he names him Ephraim, which means God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. I am able to move on and delight in the abundance of his blessing. In his time, he is working out his perfect plan for me. I don't have to be bitter over the past, no matter how evil and ugly others have been to me. God will bring fruit and a harvest out of my times of pain and famine. Chapter 45, he reveals himself to his brothers, and he says these things. He says, God sent me before you to preserve life. God sent me before you to preserve a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. And then, in contrast, chapter 42 Verse 27, when the brothers are headed home from Egypt, they see that the silver, which they had thought they paid for the food with, it was stuffed back into their sacks. And so they have this great fear. They panic, thinking we're in trouble for stealing our silver back. This is their response. Their hearts failed them, and they turned trembling to one another, saying, what is this that God has done to us? So the brothers see God working against them. Joseph see God, sees God working for him. And so here's the question we all have to ask ourselves every day. What do you see And again, go back to the text, verse 20, you meant evil against me, God meant it for good. And so Joseph is saying <clears throat> that he not only doesn't have the right or the knowledge to retaliate, I don't need to. And the reason for that is because this is what I see. I see that God always overcomes and transforms the destructive purposes of evil into his own saving purposes. I see that. And as well, another way to think about it is that God will perfectly judge and use everything to weave a perfect tapestry out of my life. The pride in Joseph's heart led to the anger and the resentment of the brothers so that they sell him into slavery. He spends years in dungeons and prisons, seemingly forgotten, and all of it led to everybody's salvation. Now, some of us look back on our past, whether it is our own evil, it is the evil of others perpetrated against us, and our hearts fail. We wallow in self-pity. How could God let this happen? I don't deserve this. What is God doing? And this is what Joseph sees. In 45 verse 5, he says, 
And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here, for God sent me here before you to preserve life. So in other words, don't wallow in the pig pen of your own grief and guilt. You can look back on your ugly past, whether it is your own evil or evil worked against you, and you can say, thank you for working the good. And again, what do you see? Do you live with perpetual joy and gratitude because you see the goodness of God? Or are you wallowing in the mud of self-pity and demanding an explanation for the trial that has come your way? Randy Elkhorn wrote a book called If God is Good, Faith in the Midst of Suffering and Evil. He tells a story about a friend of his, Ethel Herr, had a double mastectomy. Two months later, doctors discovered that the cancer had spread. And one of Herr's friends, shocked, fumbling for words, asked her, and how do you feel about God now? And reflecting on the moment that the question was posed to her, she said this, as I sought to explain what has happened in my spirit, it all became clearer to me. God has been preparing me for this moment. He has undergirded me in ways I've never known before. He has made himself increasingly real and precious to me. He has given to me such joy as I've never known before, and I have no need to work at it. It just comes even amidst the tears. He has taught me that no matter how good my genes are, or how well I take care of my diet and myself, he will lead me for a moment on whatever journey he chooses and will never leave me for a moment on that journey. And he planned it all in such a way that step by step, he prepared me for the moment when the doctor dropped the last shoe. And finally she said, God is good no matter what the diagnosis or the prognosis or the fearfulness of uncertainty of having neither. The key to knowing God is good is simply knowing him. One of the more famous texts that we are acquainted with is Romans 8 verse 28. We know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him. He's always working good for us. And again, do you see it? John Piper, in his book, A Sweet and Bitter Providence, offers these thoughts about what God does with us in life. He says, life is not a straight line leading from one blessing to the next and then finally to heaven. Life is a winding and troubled road, switchback after switchback. And the point of biblical stories like Joseph and Job and Esther and Ruth is to help us feel in our bones, not just know in our heads that God is for us in all these strange turns. God is not just showing up after the trouble and cleaning it up. He is plotting the course and managing the troubles with far-reaching purposes for our good and for the glory of Jesus Christ. Or, here's a kid's version that I just came across on social media this past week. There's my plan, and then there's God's plan. And this person says, sometimes God doesn't do things the way we think he should, but God has a perfect plan for your life. Does anybody identify with this? Yes, yes, right? Say this with me. God is always working good for me. All right? God is always working good for me. Now, the third thing that we need to see for our healing, for our transformation, in much the same way that Joseph experienced it, is this. 
We need to see that God is using me for others. Again, Joseph is in sync with God and desiring the same thing that God desires here. In Genesis 50, verse 20, he says, As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. And again, chapter 45, Joseph repeatedly pointed to how God sent me to preserve life. So here's what Joseph sees. God has worked through the wild and painful circumstances of my life so that I will become an instrument of salvation for others. It's not merely about us. There's no other place I would rather be, he says. God's desire is my desire. His mission is my mission. In order to thank God in the midst of evil and hard times, we have to be defined by something much greater than ourselves. That's why we sing earlier about his kingdom and being a part of his kingdom coming. It's not even about the church. It's not about your family. It's about something much bigger. It's about his kingdom. We have to be defined by God's mission to redeem and save the world and see our place in that redemptive work. Matthew Henry, Bible commentator, years ago, said this. He says, sometimes Christ sees that we need sickness for the good of our souls more than healing for the good of our bodies. So sometimes we need sickness and not help. And sometimes we need financial problems and not wealth. And sometimes we need conflict and strained relationships rather than peace and harmony. All with purpose. The opposition and the pain that comes our way is about God working his perfect good in us, shaping us to become like Jesus, and then being used to draw others to Jesus. Now, some of you are thinking, I've tried this and it doesn't work for me. Anybody there? Yes, yes, I've tried this, it doesn't work for me. You don't know what I've suffered through. I don't see how there can be any good that comes out of my sin and the wounds that I have suffered. Joseph's example, yeah, that's nice. But I wake up every day thinking about me over and over. I'm not about being used for others. Very much. And you would be right with that. Because there is no transformation or power in the example of Joseph. Or anyone else. And so this is why we hear this word again today. We gather around the communion table today to celebrate the Lord's Supper because it is really only the gospel that transforms and empowers us to be truly different. Joseph's story wonderfully points to the ultimate story of the gospel. And here's what what Joseph communicated to his brothers. That rejection and that suffering that you inflicted on me was really ultimately given to me by God for our salvation. We can be healed to act with joy, gratitude, and selfless love when we see and receive the selfless love of Jesus for us. So you may remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, When Jesus asked his father, if there's any other way than going to the cross, if there's any other way than having to drink the cup of God's wrath, and he said, nevertheless, not my will but yours be done. And so on the cross, Jesus received and drank the cup of God's wrath so that we who deserve that wrath 
can drink the cup of joy and blessing even in the midst of suffering. The cross is the ultimate example of how God brings good out of suffering. Amen? And we can struggle with our trials and say, I don't want this. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours. And we can do that when we see that Jesus suffered horrible injustice. He was envied. He was hated. He was rejected by his family. Sold for pieces of silver. Tempted with all kinds of sin. It doesn't matter what you have suffered through whether it's some kind of abuse or rejection or a nagging pain or a painful loss, Jesus entered our world to struggle in the pit with us. Just like Joseph was in a pit over and over. And yet in the pit, Jesus went on to pursue God's desires even to the point of suffering death for you. And then God highly exalted him as a ruler of all so that many would be saved. Recognize that story. So how are we saved? Acts 14, verse 22, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. If Jesus must suffer to bring about good, how much more should we have to suffer to bring about good? Through the hardships, we are saved, and others are saved through us. Do you believe, do you see that God is working perfectly in you, even while you suffer, especially while you suffer? And Jesus surrendered to him. He redeemed the crazy journey of the gospel and suffering so that our journey can be redeemed through our surrender our faith. Sometimes we struggle because like Job, we're convinced we don't deserve it. But you should never look to God for what you deserve. Amen? Don't ask him for what you deserve. We can only receive his mercy when we believe the gospel that we are much worse than we understand. We deserve only punishment. And at the same time, we are much more loved than we ever dreamed possible because of his grace and love. In Job, Job 2, it says, shall we accept good from God and not trouble? We have a Savior who suffers with us and for us, so that we can accept both good and trouble as we are changed and become instruments of change. Some of us here are carrying all kinds of baggage through life. Baggage from our past, and some of you are just limping along through life with sarcasm, bitterness, anger, cynicism, Anybody want to raise their hand and volunteer some of that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? And that ugliness sometimes, it just oozes out of your heart. And it affects you, it affects your family, it affects your workplace. But see, listen, what you see here is that through Jesus you can reinterpret the pain and the hard times of your past and see that God has always been working for you and with you for your salvation, your beauty, your joy. Jesus began his ministry by claiming he was the fulfillment of this prophecy. Isaiah 61. This is Jesus for us. The Lord has anointed me to bind up the brokenhearted, to comfort all who mourn 
and provide for those who grieve, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. One of the most beautiful wildflowers in North America is the fireweed. This is a delicate purple pink, the purple pink blossoms, and it has a number of uses. It is good for upset stomachs, for coughs, asthma, treat bites, cuts, eczema. Give it a shot sometime, right? But the blossoms are also used as well to make a flavorful jelly and honey. It is named the fireweed because their stems survive underground and they are the first plants to bloom after a fire. And so, for example, this photo here shows how a fireweed is beginning to emerge from the ground after the ground was scorched, covered with ashes from the eruption of Mount St. Helens about 40 years ago. When the smoke clears, the earth cools, these flowers are the first to emerge from the blackened earth. Fireweed covers the landscape like a stunning quilt, trading beauty for ashes. And this is what God has for every one of us, no matter where you've been. And this is what we celebrate as we gather around the table here this morning. On the cross, Jesus endured suffering and death and was raised to life so that we who deserve death can be raised to a new life through the suffering. That's what we think about as we come around the table here this morning. If you are a baptized Christian and you are trusting in Jesus for your salvation, you're welcome to receive this Holy Communion with us. Let's pray together. Holy Father, in the joy of Jesus' resurrection and in expectation of his coming again, we offer ourselves to you as holy and living sacrifices. Send your Holy Spirit upon us, we pray, so that the bread which we break and the cup which we bless will be for us, the communion. It is our sharing in the body and blood of Christ. And we pray that all of us, being joined together in him, will mature and make progress every day, pursuing Jesus' presence becoming more and more like him through the suffering, through the trials. Holy Father, we pray for your kingdom to come so that the whole church will soon be gathered from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. Come soon, Lord Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.